Now, I like to think I know a fair amount about Prince's work. That's why our Facts You Didn't Know series work so well. But one bittersweet thing is sometimes you get the feeling that with everything you learn, there's less left to learn. And then, every now and then, something happens that kicks that feeling to the curb. There aren't too many people that can do that. Dwayne Tudal did it once before with his Purple Rain book. And it would be an understatement to say he's done it again with the new one. He's done it again and then some. If I were to put it into a nice, succinct little quote, for anyone with any level of interest in this part of Prince's career, this book is everything. Now, I'll warn you ahead of time, this review contains what some may consider to be spoilers, so if you don't want to hear about the contents of the book, you might want to stop this video here. But having said that, it's basically impossible to give spoilers for a book this rich, this detailed, this chock full of information. Because the stuff that I've highlighted, the stuff that jumped out at me and made me sit bolt upright in the sofa, those probably aren't going to be the same things that do that for you. And that's the beauty of this book. Whether your interest simply lies in the stories behind the songs you grew up with, songs like Kiss, Mountains, Sign of the Times, or whether you're more like me and you're looking for information that we just didn't know before, like the mysteries of the vault, which, even with the recent super deluxe releases, we're only just scratching the surface of. Or anywhere in between those two things, there is information detailed recollections, anecdotes, supplemental stories for all of it. Whether you love connecting the dots between the dates, between the big events that happened in Prince's life, and what songs he'd recorded in the immediate aftermath, or whether you enjoy the random anecdotes that pop out from band members and associates, like the time Susanna Melvoin remembers wandering into the kitchen in Prince's house, only to be greeted by a random naked woman that Prince had apparently picked up the night before, there's something for everyone in this book. So just when you think you knew a few things about any given era of Prince's life, this book throws you continuous curveballs, where every single event can almost read like a crossroads, and you can not only understand the path we know Prince took at that juncture, but we can also see the path not taken. So for example, what are we to make of the fact that, amidst crumbling personal relationships with the revolution, Amidst folks like Brownmark having expressed extreme dissatisfaction at the state of affairs in 1986, that we now learn that Prince actually not only had, but also recorded a previously unknown about jam session at that time with his former bass player and childhood best friend Andre Simone five full years after Andre left the band. Then after disbanding the revolution, just days later, Prince, Andre and Sheila had another six hour jam session, but this time with Jody Watley from Shalimar on vocals. What are we to make of the fact that, when first putting together the band The Family, Prince pulled out his first recording of the song Rough, which not only dated back to the earliest days of the time, but actually still had Alexander O'Neill on vocals, from before he was replaced as frontman by Morris Day. And that there likely exists a vocal with Susanna and Paul on that song, making this song the only artifact of two drastically different eras as far as protege acts go, but also drawing a clear parallel between the way he viewed those protege acts. We also get solid answers for why certain projects never saw the light of day, like the long bootleg but unfinished Apollonia 6 mini movie. We learn in this book that after seeing a cut of the short film, Prince grew frustrated, called it a piece of shit, and trashed the whole project. We learn unquestionably that money was the root cause of the revolution breaking up, with Wendy, Lisa, and Bobby having attempted to negotiate a salary some 20 times higher than what they were actually getting paid. A request that actually doesn't sound unreasonable when you consider both Prince's unrelenting schedules and requirements for his creative partners, and the fact that this comes right off the back of Purple Rain and its huge success. We get to draw a line under the infamous story of Prince writing Shockadelica after learning that Jesse Johnson's album was named that, learning that he did in fact run off an instrumental mix and pushed hard for Jesse to record a lead vocal on it and use it. The only problem was that Jesse had actually already submitted his album to the label, and didn't feel it would be fair to the fans that had already bought the first pressing to then add another song to a later pressing. 
The chronological diary-esque format works so well, not just at blowing you away with the pace of how quickly Prince worked, but with understanding Prince and his musical expression. This was a man who, as we all know, expressed himself best through music. So it's fascinating to learn that, just three days after having the infamous dinner where he fired Wendy and Lisa, the first new song that he writes for himself is It Bees Like That Sometimes, released last year on the Sign of the Time Super Deluxe set, and the lyrics can clearly be taken as his commentary on this. When you also note that he recorded Violet Blue for Jill Jones the exact same day, and both songs have virtually the same drum track, you even have to wonder whether he ever intended to release the former, or whether it was just something he had to get out of his system. It's these details and continual context from band members placed together, day by day, that weave the human element into this book. Without them, it would just be a list of recording sessions, and it's a credit to Dwayne's writing that it never feels like that. It's often said that Prince was the musician's musician, as in, your favorite musician's favorite musician. If that's the case, then Dwayne Tadal is the Prince historian's favorite Prince historian. At the time Dwayne's first book came out, I gave it a perfect score. And whilst I of course stand by that, it does imply that it can't be bettered. And yet somehow Dwayne has done exactly that. Prince and the Parade and Sign of the Times era studio sessions is my book of the year. It's simply a masterpiece and essential for all Prince fans and pop culture historians alike. Buy it, buy another copy for your best friend, and then buy it again just in case you lose the first one. A huge, huge shout out to Dwayne. We are lucky to have such a steadfast, thorough detailing of the history of the greatest artist of all time. Prince and the Parade and Sign of the Times era studio sessions will be released on June 10th, 2021, with a foreword written by Sir Elton John and published by Roman and Littlefield. You can pre-order it now from Amazon or your preferred bookstore. And Dwayne's last book was a 10 out of 10, and to paraphrase Spinal Tap, this one got turned up to 11. Peace and be wild, purple people. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the little bell for notifications, leave us a comment on this video if you're intending to buy this book, and we'll see you next time. Hey, St. Paul here. Make sure you go subscribe to The Violet Reality, the funkiest channel on YouTube.